Hello, everybody. My name is Annie Minoff. I'm the Sci Arts producer here at Science Friday and a very proud member of our Science Friday book club. And I want to welcome all of you to our Meet the Engineers live panel. And we're going to talk about why it's called Meet the Engineers in just a moment. Um, but a little background on the Science Friday book club, if you're a newbie. Um, this is something that Science Friday does twice a year. We pick a book and we ask you to read it. And then we have a bunch of conversations about it on air, online. Uh, and that's what we're doing today. Um, and the book we're talking about is our uh, book pick for this summer. Um, and it has been called by Wired Magazine the original nerd epic. Um, but it's Tracy Kidder's Pulitzer Prize winner from 1981, uh, The Soul of a New Machine. And as Ira would say, it's an oldie but a goodie. Um, and joining us for our hangout today are three of the engineers who were actually profiled in that book by Tracy Kidder. Um, they brought this new machine to life and, more than three decades ago now, uh, and they've been kind enough to dredge up those memories uh, for us and to answer our questions. Um, and it is now my great pleasure to introduce them. Um, and I'll start with Carl Alsing. Uh, Carl led Eagle's microcode team, working closely with manager Tom West. Uh, and if you're reading the book, you might remember him as the midnight programmer who exposed Tracy Kidder to the adventure game for the first time. And these days, he's the senior engineer at Digital Dynamics, where he's still bringing new machines to life. He designs control systems for the semiconductor industry. Welcome, Carl. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. I'm still the midnight programmer. <laughs> Still, still working nights. Um, I do. <laughs> our, our, we also have joining us Chuck Holland, uh, and he worked with Carl to create Eagle's microcode. And after leaving Data General, he was involved in a number of tech startups. Uh, but these days, he calls himself an online literacy instigator. He's working with the organization Hill for Literacy, creating online writing courses. And you can learn more about that by clicking on the link at the right. I'm sorry, the right side of your screen. Uh, welcome, Chuck. Thank you, Annie. Great to be here. Great to have you. And our final microcoder, uh, Betty Shanahan, who was one of the so-called micro kids during uh, working on Eagle's microcode. Uh, and post Data General, she joined uh, a number of other Data General alums at Alliant Computer Systems. Uh, and then she spent 11 years of her career as the executive director and CEO of the Society of Women Engineers. And today, she's in administration at Michigan State University. Welcome, Betty. Oh, it's wonderful to be here with Carl and, uh, and Chuck. It's a little bit of a Data General reunion today. Um, and before we kick off, if you would like to ask any of these wonderful engineers a question, um, we very much invite you to do that. You can submit uh, your question. If you're watching us within Google Hangouts, um, go to the Q&A app, and that'll pop up right on my screen, and we'll take your question. Um, if you're viewing us via the live stream, uh, the best way to answer your, I'm sorry, to ask your question is via Twitter. Um, and you do that by using the hashtag sci book club. Um, and now, without any further ado, um, actually, right before we went live, uh, Chuck showed us something pretty cool. So if you're reading the book right now, you might remember uh, that when he was hired at Data General during his uh, job interview, which was actually conducted by Carl Alsing, um, he talked about a sculpture that he was creating. Um, and it turns out that Chuck actually still has that sculpture that we read about in the book. Um, and if possible, I'm going to ask him to kind of take us take us on a trip to see that. You might remember this is kind of a, a um, marble and kind of a marble contraption. I don't know, Chuck, do you want to explain what this is? Well, it's sort of a Rube Goldberg my, uh, uh, ball game. Just uh, I just had this idea that I wanted to build this thing, and I started doing it. Took a welding course just to use their equipment, and my grandkids love it. So it lasted for a long time. You throw the balls at the top, and it lets them go one at a time. I call that my one logic gate because it gives it a few seconds before the next ball goes down. And they go down. They make interesting noises as they go, and the little kids love it. I don't know why I loved it, but I did. And actually, Tracy Kidder, uh, as I understand it, kind of visited your home to kind of see this contraption. Is that right? That's right. Yes. And Carl, tell us why, on the strength of this sculpture, you decided uh, to hire Chuck. Well, after I asked the usual uh, line of questions about education and experience, uh, I sat back and, in a casual way, said, tell me what you do for fun and relaxation. And uh, it's a trick question. Um, it's, it, lets, lets the, it lets Chuck talk about um, the things that he loves to do, and he talked about building this machine. 
And I was very interested because, uh, you know, we're looking for people who aren't just knowledgeable engineers, but people who like to build things. And uh, here he'd build something. So then the second trick question was, does it still work? And he said it did. So I was impressed. And uh, it was a fun thing. It's artistic as well as technical. And uh, he completed it. Um, most people start projects like that and get 95% to the end. And then uh, it never really works out. Or it works for a week and then dies. So I was impressed. And it's still working some 35 years later? Something and that tells you something about the engineer that Chuck is. <laughs> All right, so I want to kick off uh, with a question for each of you. And the question is um, how you got involved in this Eagle project. How did Eagle enter your lives? How did you become involved in this, this crazy quest to build this 32-bit mini computer? Um, and I'm going to start with you, Carl. How did it happen to you? OK, well, um, I worked for Tom West, who I really miss and wish he were here. Um, the book is a lot about him. Um, Tom West had uh, this problem that our company was behind the times. We were being, uh, we were being swamped by uh, our big competitor, uh, Digital Equipment Corporation. And we needed to build a new, fresh design for a machine, a 32-bit machine. And um, the president of the company had decided that that would be done in another office in, in North Carolina. So uh, we went to him with a proposal for a new architecture, and he said, no, no, you're not going to do that. I just want you to you know, fix up, the, fix up your last year's machine, your 16-bit machine. And uh, we weren't successful in persuading him. So This was Ed DeCastro, who you were Ed DeCastro at, at Data General. So we proposed a machine that um, looked like the old machine. And... Um, he looked at it and he said, "Well, I don't know. This is this is this a, is this a new? Are you trying to do the new architecture again?" And we said, "Oh no." no. <laughs> he said, "Well, does it have a mode bit where you turn on the new uh, architecture and, and turn off the old?" And we said, "No, no. There's no mode bit. Honest, it's just if you no run here. <laughs> if you run an old application from you know the old computers, it'll run just fine." And he said, "Okay, go ahead." And we went right ahead and built the, um, the Eagle without telling him what it could do. Now, Betty, I mentioned that you were one of these micro kids, meaning that you were pretty much hired, as I understand it, directly out of engineering school uh, to work on this project. How did you get sucked into Eagle? Well, I think it's uh, not as exciting as having the marble sculpture. Uh, uh, I was graduating from Michigan State with my electrical engineering degree, and uh, Data General came recruiting, and it, it was 1978, a great time for engineers, uh, a lot of opportunities, and speaking to a number of, of different companies, and I actually got the chance to do plant visits both to Data General North Carolina and to, to Westboro, and both were very exciting uh, projects, and I think Data General overall uh, won me over just because the both in North Carolina and Westboro, the opportunity you had. It wasn't very mundane. It wasn't uh, uh, detailed work. It was working on, on new machines, and that was very exciting. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I think it was more personal reasons. Uh, I said, oh, let's go with Massachusetts. My husband actually was uh, also interviewed and joined the operating system team. So we were both we were in Massachusetts and <laughs> we were part of the new project. And what about you, Chuck? Well, you know, I was an old hand. I'd been there almost two years, I think. <laughs> so I was a college kid, too. And I'd an old there. hand at the age of, was it, like 26 or something? Yeah, I, yeah, close. Um, I, you know, Carl hired me early on when they hired a few other kids, and he gave me a couple of great projects to work on, so I was kind of busy. I wasn't paying too much attention to the if there was a war between North Carolina and yeah. here. But I did get to hear about that mode bit problem, so um, I found some time. I found myself a little bit of time. I started noodling about that, and I think I either, I either hid the mode bit, Carl, or I was I was responsible for you know implementing what they wanted it to look like. So I uh, did a lot of instruction set design and wrote some. I wrote a little memo, and then Eagle started happening around that. So I, I don't really know where it all came from because I just did my microcode piece at that point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, what we did was uh, uh, when Tom West told us we couldn't have a mode bit, 
we said, well, it can't be done. You want us to do 32-bit uh, arithmetic and 16-bit arithmetic, and oh, on top of that, you want us to address 32 bits of memory space, uh, where formerly it was 15 bits. So it's going to take at least four times as many instructions, and they're going to be very inefficient and take a lot of memory, and it's going to be expensive. Customers won't like that. Um, Tom said, don't worry about it. Go ahead. Make up a list of four times as many instructions, and if it takes more memory, we'll sell more memory. <laughs> so that's what we did. There was no mode. Yeah, Carl? back when oh. megabytes were huge. Yeah. Right. So, so Carl, help me understand how, how Tracy Kidder kind of arrives on the scene. When did he first show up? Well, he, he um, was a friend of... Uh, uh, Mr. Todd, I can't remember if it was Mike Todd or what Todd, Mr. Todd's name was, but he was an editor. He was Tracy's boss at the Atlantic Monthly, and um, and Tom West was uh, a friend of his. So Tracy said, uh, Tracy asked uh, Mike Todd what what he should do next, and Mike Todd said, Well, why don't you do something about technology and computers? And Tracy said, oh, I don't like that. I don't understand that stuff. I'm afraid of it. I'm a writer, and I, I don't know anything about computers. So Mike Todd said, well, then that's what you need to do. And I have a friend named Tom West that you should go and talk to. So Tom West talked to him, and they discussed the problem that you can't just walk into a company without getting cleared by um, you know, ex the executives. And... Uh, Tom knew that that would, it would never fly. Data General would never let a writer walk through the halls of Data General. So um, he didn't tell them. So Tracy was undercover, essentially. He was undercover. We brought him in. We brought him into all of our meetings. We brought him in the lab, even. Um, he saw it all. He talked to every one of our engineers. He talked with Chuck and Betty and myself and Tom and everyone there repeatedly for a year or so, or so. Now, Chuck, you told me that, that the way Tracy kept his finger on the pulse of what was happening with Eagle was he attended the parties. That's <laughs> right. true. Right. All right. He, um, he certainly did interview us. Uh, I think that might have been the first interaction. He came and listened for hours, but he wrote notes copiously, just kept going, writing and writing. And he also drank beer just that fast as well. So we knew right away we had a party guy. And we, you know, we like worked really hard, so we always wanted to, you know, celebrate something. So we'd make make up reasons to celebrate. And Tracy loved to come, so we we'd meet at a, at a local pub or we'd meet out in the woods and have a party. Now, Betty, did you have the feeling as you were working on Eagle, like, hey, someone's writing about this. This is going to be a book, or, or did, were you kind of not cognizant of that? Well got to realize it's my first big job uh, after college so I don't I just learned now that uh, Tracy wasn't approved to be in the building I always thought he was up until uh, a minute ago <laughs> and, uh, so you don't have any any reference to what's normal and what's not normal so if there's a writer from the Atlantic Monthly walking around so be it and he was uh, certainly as uh, both Chuck and Carl have indicated a you know, just a very engaging person, easy to talk to, fun to be around. So he was just another person there. And I think the the big surprise was when the book actually came out. Of course, there was you know, a long time in writing and production. And when it came out, to see it be a bestseller and win a Pulitzer Prize, that's, I think, where the big surprise happened for me. And what did you think when you first picked up that book? What was it like to read? Uh, it was... It, it's. I, th I think, again, put in the context that it's your first job out of college, and you're not thinking like a manager, you're not thinking like a leader, you're thinking like an individual contributor. And all of a sudden to realize how intentional so much of what was happening around us that seemed very uh, organic actually was, was thought out and was really about turning this group into a high-performance team against, you know, really against all odds. So it was was a little surprising, um, maybe a little disappointing when you realize uh, that there was a lot of management leadership going on, but it was also uh, interesting to realize what had been accomplished. I don't, I don't think I really appreciated how tough uh, what the management team was trying to do 
uh, how tough their job was until getting a lot more experience afterwards and realizing, wow, that's uh, a pretty tough task to take on. Now, Carl, you told me that you actually heard the book before you read it. Can you ex explain why that was? Yes. Well, when Tracy finished each chapter, he would call me and say, come up on Saturday. I need to go over chapter three with you. I finished writing it. So I would go to his house, and um, the first time I said, well, give it here. Let me read it. And he said, oh, no, I'm not going to let you read it. I have to read it to you. You have to hear it. I, to this day, don't fully understand why that was. But uh, So I sat down, and he read the chapter to me. And whenever there was a, you know, a technical error, I would correct him. And uh, that way, you know, we got all the names right, and the names of the machines right, and the, and the computer logic was, was right. Um, we sort of proofread it verbally. And then once in a while, he would uh, ask me a, a question that uh, developed into a little story, or I might think of something and tell him about it. And some of those things made it into the book. So that was really fun. What kind of things did you spot in the book that you were like, hey, that's from a conversation I had with Tracy? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, let's see. There was the time when Tom West had been uh, sidelined and sent to Japan to get him out of the group. He had a little political alert. problem. Spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so his, his man he got a new manager, and the new manager said, well, you got to stop doing this silly stuff. We're just going to send you to Japan to do marketing, which, you know, he doesn't speak Japanese, so what is that? So that meant he had to vacate his office, and he went off to Japan, and we were charged with moving all of his personal stuff out of his office into a and up into the marketing area. And he had this beautiful, big old oak time clock. Uh, it was a, a a beautiful, not a grandfather clock, but a a small one for industrial purposes, and for I think it was for uh, punch cards in the old days. And it was a beautiful piece of machinery, and we put it on a little dolly and pushed it to the elevator and went up the elevator, and it was just really sad. And I told Tracy about this, and that ended up in the book. So those, those little stories got in. It was just you know, kind of fun. Um, Jeff, what was your experience of Tom West as a manager? You know, we read the book, and we hear a lot about you know, mushroom management. Um, what was your experience with mushroom management? Um, well, mushroom management is not just Tom, but I think um, – he, to, Tom was, to me, kind of behind the scenes. So, like, Ed and, and Carl were maybe protecting us or not, and that left, left a mystique. So um, some folks could push, push through and be kind of buddy-buddy with them, and others were kind of a little afraid what's, what, what, what might happen if you, if you talk to them. Um, I do think the, the mushroom management thing, um, you know, we were – you know, mushrooms, when they first start growing, that's us. We were young engineers growing. So we didn't know what we couldn't do. And they hit all the bullshit. As you're just now learning, even Betty and I are learning some bullshit right now. <laughs> uh, some management bullshit. So um, that, that's, I think that's a very appropriate statement. Um, cutting our heads off, you know, if we pop up, I guess, man, I might have feared that a little bit too. I guess it's happened to Tom for a short time. And maybe it's happened to us in other, other situations as well. And Betty, did you have much interaction with Tom? What kind of manager was he for you? Uh, I actually sat right outside Tom West's door. So it was a little interesting because in spite of the fact I sat right outside his door and, and uh, many of his visitors assumed I was his secretary because of my location, <laughs> uh, I actually didn't have very much interaction with him at all. Uh, I, I feel like uh, I guess I was one of those people that was afraid of him. And, uh, and an interaction with Tom did not mean a good thing. So, and uh, so much of, I think, what motivated me, and I would imagine some of my colleagues, was uh, that if we didn't succeed, Carl would be in trouble, Ed would be in trouble, Chuck would be in trouble. You know, so you had to get your part done to keep them from being in the, uh, the crosshairs of Tom West. And I had a very interesting situation when uh, Tom actually had moved on to Japan, and he happened to be back in Westboro, 
and I bumped into him on the hall, and he said, hi, Betty. And it just took me aback, because I don't think he'd ever called me by my name uh, <laughs> before that, and I didn't realize he knew my name. So I, uh, my interaction was just really uh, uh, very minimal and, and try and get my job done so uh, those, those who are entrusting me with the work don't get in trouble. Now, Tom, Tom knew all about you. Um, when we were considering hiring you, you know, at the time we were th looking at, at engineers who didn't have many family ties so that they could really devote all their energy to our project. Not and we were, we were, but there is an exception to that in that when we considered your resume, we realized you, had a, you were engaged to Bob Newber. Yeah. And uh, that he was going to go somewhere else and get some job somewhere, and that was going to be a conflict for you. And we wanted you very much. So Tom said, well, go see if we can get Bob Newber here. And so I went over to the software department and showed him their resume, his resume and talked him into uh, you know, giving him additional consideration. Now, maybe they would have hired him anyway. I don't know. But we made sure that both of you got offers. Oh, well, thank you, Carl. It's the first time I've learned that. Thank you very much. Yeah, and that was Tom's idea. Oh, well, so he was not totally against people with, with uh, family ties. Uh, it looks like we have a question in. This is from Randy Glissman, and he says, uh, I used to work for Carl in the 1970s. Before Eagle, Data General had a computer on a chip called the Micronova. Did Data General miss the boat by not marketing this chip? So, Carl, I'll send that one to you. Well, I, th I think that hurt them. I think it would have been good if they could have um, could have marketed the Micronova. It was it was an interesting little product. Um, maybe it didn't have everything it needed to do well, and maybe it was a, a year or so late. But uh, I think Data General should have pushed it. I remember those days. Gardner Hendry created that, and you were working with him at first. I think. Um, I'll just remind everyone, you can ask a question uh, for the panel. Um, if you're in the Google Hangout, uh, you just click on the little Q&A app. Um, and if you are on Twitter, just use the hashtag sci book club. Oh, we've got another one. Um, this one comes from Steve Davey. He asks, in the book, often engineers are referred to anonymously. Were there any incidences in the narrative where engineers or an engineer was actually referring to any of you that stood out? I, I have one situation. Uh, there is a point where uh, Tom West yells at a group of engineers for making noise, and that was <laughs> Dave Peck and Bob Beecham in my office. <laughs> there you go, Steve. <laughs> um, Chuck, I have a question for you. Uh, when we were talking earlier, you compared Data General to a startup, and I wonder if you can explain where you see that connection. How is it like a startup? Well, it you know, there's the energy, um, it's, it's the entrepreneurialness that Data General, I think, had. Um, with Data General started as a startup. Um, a lot of people left and did startups afterwards. Um, there is creativity and um, hard work involved in all the startup projects I've done and I've been involved in, and they seem very similar to me. So this was a project that was fairly self-contained in the company, at least as far as we were concerned. So we were that small group that was trying to do something new. Now, Betty, I mentioned uh, that you spent 11 years of your career as the CEO of the Society of Women Engineers, and I wondered how different or not um, the atmosphere might be for women in tech today as compared to you know when you were at Data General as the sole um, female engineer on that team. Well, sadly, I think uh, there's still a lot of the same obstacles for women today that there were then, and in uh, back in the data general time, there were some interesting situations where Carl may remember where you know someone didn't want to work with me because I was a woman, and he in actually insisted that that person work with me. And actually, I built a great relationship with him over time. Uh, and uh, so that doesn't happen today. I think there's a, a much more of a understanding of uh, to be more uh, diverse. But I don't think there's always an understanding of how to be inclusive for women, so that uh, when women are, st are still a very small minority in engineering, only 18% of engineering degrees today go to women, uh, they're still in a very male-dominated environment. And uh, I think some of the challenges is uh, you uh, there's unconscious bias, there's uh, 
uh, expectations of a culture that uh, if the men and the women don't understand, and it, it remains a, a challenge for women today. So at Society of Women Engineers, we like to think that before too long, uh, our mission will be complete and the organization will need to, to continue. But uh, a lot of our time is we're really uh, spent working with employers, helping them understand how to create that inclusive environment for women and all people from underrepresented groups because it's that diversity that's going to get better products. Yeah. Um, Carl, what do people not know about solving them? Well, not know. Let's see. Um, what are we not getting in that book? <laughs> the behind the scenes stuff. Ah, uh, let's see. Secrets. Let me think. Um, Tom West had a vice president, a boss named Carl Carmen. And Carl Carmen was responsible for all of engineering at Data General in Massachusetts. There was this North Carolina rival. They were Data General North Carolina. And they had been charged with building the newest machine, the, the new architecture. And that didn't please Carl Carmen at all. He wanted it done under his roof. So Tom would go to him and say, I have somebody that I'd like to have in the lab who writes. And Carl Carmen said, don't tell me about that. I don't need to know about that. <laughs> so there were a number of things that Tom West did and Carl Carmen sort of knew about and gave him room for. Maybe another example is the recruiting. We needed 30 engineers all at once because we needed to build a computer in a year. So we went to Carl Carmen and we said, um, we want to go and hire 30 college grads right now for May. <laughs> and he said, he didn't say why. He didn't say how much will that cost. He said, OK. Because he knew that Tom West was going to use them to build him the 32 machine that he needed in Massachusetts. So none of this, I don't think. Uh, anybody in the group knew about that kind of stuff. Um, Chuck, is it true that at one point there was a plan to make Solve a New Machine a movie? Oh yeah, <laughs> there was. <laughs> Somebody bought the screen uh, rights for, to write the screenplay. Do you remember the name of that guy, Carl? No, I don't recall. Um, yeah, he had written some a movie that we all knew, so he was like a real Hollywood guy. And he came down and inter interviewed us, sort of like, uh, sort of like uh, Tracy did. Although I think he drank uh, scotch or something, a little different. A <laughs> uh, different kind of guy. Yeah, different kind of guy. And um, he didn't take a lot of notes. He interviewed us, and um, nothing really happened that we know of. <laughs> um, and I got, we got the feeling that it wasn't sexy enough. <laughs> that you're right. You know, we didn't tell him any like sexy secrets, hidden things, or stuff. You know. Nobody got shot. <laughs> no, there was no. Yeah, he didn't hear any drama in it that would make a movie. I guess there were no car chases. There was one car chase. I remember you and I chasing each other around a muddy parking lot in our cars one day. I'm not surprised. And <laughs> afterwards, we thought we should have made some up or told them some of the real dirt. Yeah, <laughs> the real dirt would have gotten us in trouble, probably. That's true. <laughs> Betty, I want to ask you this question. Do you think that Solve a New Machine kind of captures something essential um, about what it's like to be an engineer? Is this a book that you would kind of recommend a budding engineer even, even today in 2015? It, it does. Uh, I've had uh, two different academic opportunities to talk about the book. Uh, for a while, I was a guest lecturer at an MIT introduction to engineering class. And then for several years, I spoke at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business in their high, um, class on building high performance teams about the book. And uh, in both cases, one of the things I'd like to point out is there's a chapter about Jim Veris debugging. Uh, and to me, that, that really kind of captures a lot of uh, what engineering is about. It's that, that total focus where you just forget to have lunch, and all of a sudden your stomach is growling because you never ate lunch. And you're just so focused and in the in the moment with the problem and that's I think that's a lot of the uh, I think the real life of being an engineer and then and then it's the creation part the, the uh, 
the ability to take a group of people, put them together, and make something that didn't exist before. And you know, the, the mini computer industry in a lot of ways I don't think got a lot of the excitement some of the other parts of the computer industry did, but the mini computer industry made it possible to solve problems um, in areas that those problems didn't uh, couldn't be solved before. I, I remember that data general computers were in the first uh, GE CAT scanners. And you know, to, to have that kind of contribution and to be part of a small team that makes something new to solve new problems. I, I think the, the book captures some of the excitement of, of making something new, as well as the being in the moment part of being an engineer. All right, we have a new question coming in. It says, this is for all of you. Um, what is your perception of the tech industry slash Silicon Valley today, and how do you think the tech culture differs from your experience? Big question. Uh, anyone want to take that first? Do the compare contrast with Silicon Valley? I'm going to pick Chuck. <laughs> wow. Um, so I mean, for a while, I, I guess it just Silicon Valley just it just seemed like there that what we were doing went into waves. I, I never thought that many computer company you know companies would end and that the whole market would go away. But then came the PCs and then came the 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 uh, internet. Um, but now it's you know tech no longer necessarily means designing a computer. I mean. Biotech. There is so much. We um, I'm involved in an ed tech group. It's all about teaching kids, and but there's some technology involved, and there's it's so much of it now is moved to the cloud. Though you know, and so many people can do programming. We, we're not, we know when Carl was the first microcoder, I think at DG, and I was the second, and we, nobody even knows about microcoding anymore. But that you know, now people know about all kinds of coding, and there is just, I think it's it's. It's got beyond itself. I think people talk about startups. They talk about the kinds of things that we did as uh, in, in our daily life. Yeah. Um, we have another question. Um, what were your dreams about the growth of computer technology in the industry while developing Eagle? Um, and how accurate were your hopes and predictions? So, so what was the dream as you were building this machine? And, and I guess, uh, were those realized? Uh, and I'll send this one to Carl. Okay, well, I think, you know, the dream, of course, was to build the leading mini computer for the next few years. And uh, we were hoping we could defeat our, our big competitor and, and step ahead in the market. We also had stock options at Data General, and we were hoping to make some money, too. Um, but maybe that wasn't the biggest motive. I think the biggest motive was to be part of something new and, and better. And... Uh, um, that's universal. That's always going to happen. Um, that's still going on now, everywhere. Um, I, my dreams then were, um, well, those were my dreams. Uh, I like to build things. I wanted to make something. Uh, I didn't want to be on the sidelines or, or uh, write boring programs. So uh, I wanted to be where the smart people were. And I, I've, I've always... Um, uh, associated myself with the smartest people around, and uh, that has its pluses and minuses. The minus is, of course, that I'm the dumbest guy in the room. Um, but the great thing is that I get to be with people who are really doing amazing things, like Tom West and Chuck Holland, Betty Shanahan. Uh, we had a very successful group, didn't we? All of us, the 30-odd the micro kids and hardy boys all went on to do great things. Yes. And I think it's important that we had a lot of fun doing it, too. Yeah. You know, considering the intensity of what we were going through, in some ways that's almost a, a formula for uh, stress and challenge uh, and just a team dysfunction. And we had quite the opposite. I think we were ver all very close to each other and all watched each other's back, supported each other when we needed to, and, and had lots of laughs, lots and lots of laughs. Oh, yes. Well, what contributed... Betty, to that sense of camaraderie, do you think? Is that something that you know managers today can consciously foster among, among their teams? Yeah, it's actually interesting. Uh, when I, I uh, was working on my own MBA, the book was a case in one of my classes. And my, uh, when I went to the prof to explain I had a, that I was in the case, he said, read the book with the thought about high-performance teams. And it really opened my eyes to the book in a, in a new way and what, what happened in a new way. And 
that I was talking earlier about realizing that there was a lot of intentionality in what was going on, and that that was really good. I think um, uh, Carl and Ed, um, Chuck, Ken, all those guys really uh, fostered uh, an environment where we would do things like recognize each other. Giving out PAL awards was was a way of supporting each other and, and giving that recognition. Uh, having you know, going to the Red Barn or um, you know, Piccadilly Pub was a, was a way to release tension. And uh, you know, in those days, you didn't move without having everybody else from the team help uh, pack you up and move you to a new home. So I think they, you know, they created that camaraderie, and that probably was as important as any of the technology in getting the machine out the door. Thoughts on that, Carl and Chuck? Well, I, for me, I, I think it set me off um, thinking about company cultures, too. Um, I did a lot of studying of, of uh, other, mostly high-tech companies, and, you know, I wanted to create the same kind of culture elsewhere, and, and I did, and so when I finally left Data General, I started a startup or two, um, and we were really big on what's the company culture, because that's what keeps us all together and you get more, and I probably didn't use the term high performance team, but that's what you get. So I think, you know, we, we learned it there. And I know Betty mentioned uh, the awards that you all would give each other, um, and I know, Chuck, that you created some pretty elaborate awards for members of your team. Can you talk about the award that you created for Ken Holberger? Well, yeah, I guess probably the last last little thing I created because this one took some time, but it was a miniature version of, of the computer we built, and it looks like what's behind you um, on the screen. The three three little modules, the tapes, the little little things spinning there were, were knobs, and it used some actual uh, old switches from the from the computer days, so it made noises and blinking lights and looked like a little mini MV. I probably. Uh, took, I'm not sure, but I probably took the product literature, cut it out, and pasted it on these boxes so it would look real. And that, that was the award. Uh, I think we're going to have to wrap up soon. So I have one kind of, well, maybe two. We'll see what, how, how fast we go. Uh, two final questions for you. Um, and the first one is, and this goes to all of you, uh, the book is called, you know, Soul of a New Machine. So um, what was motivating you? in that moment to kind of throw yourself, throw your whole self, your soul, into this new machine? I'll start with Carl. I think that um, in the same way that a book will um, pose some problems and then um, keep you in suspense until the last chapter, um, this, this project was like that. You know, Tom West outlined this project and I said, this can, can't be done. This is ridiculous. It, we don't have the approval of management. We have to invent stuff that hasn't been invented before. We have to do it with engineers with no experience. This is impossible. Um, and he said, I'm going to do it. Are you with me or not? And I said to myself, well, I want to find out how this turns out. I mean, if I quit, I'll, I'll, you know. So a lot of my motivation was just, just to watch Tom and see if he could pull it off. And he did, and it was a very satisfying year and a half. Chuck, how about you? So um, I was all about solving the problem, you know, solving the problem, building something, and finishing it. And I, um, be because I had a piece that I specifically worked on, kind of the creation of the instruction set that would make this 32 bits happen, then I really you know, was embedded. It was like my baby. I, I had to make this happen, so whatever piece, whatever it took, I would do it. Um, also, I was helping hiring some of these uh, micro kids, so I really felt close to the team. Um, they were very close in age to me, and we were just all uh, one big group. So I think there was there's a real almost family tie to it. And Betty, uh, it's probably a combination of uh, things. Uh, one is just the sense of not letting down the people who've entrusted you. It's you know it's it's the first real job. I had an internship as an engineer, but my first real job out of college, definitely want to be successful, and I think I did not underestimate how exciting a position this is for a first job. Uh, I'm very competitive, so I didn't want to have any of the guys on the project outdo me. I, I think I would have been mortified if I ever uh, had something taken from me because I couldn't complete it. And um, and third is uh, just, just a real pride of creation. There's uh, I remember I had um, 
I had one piece of microcode that uh, the operating systems guys found ran so fast they used it to zero memory, even though it caused trouble much later because they shouldn't have been using that instruction. And later machines, they, it didn't perform like that, and it um, caused them problems in later uh, machines. But I was just like so excited that I could make something special. So it's, I think a mixture of all three happening at once. Wow. Um, we do have a few more minutes, so I get to ask my last question, uh, which is, I mean, so many computers, you know, no one uses this machine anymore. We're kind of, I think many people reading this book are encountering the mini computer for the first time. Um, so my question is, what do you see as the relevance for a story like this uh, today? Who wants to take that one? Well, it's very relevant. Um, nothing has significantly changed over the years except the size and the cost of the technology. You know, this little computer is a lot more powerful than the one we built. Uh, so it's smaller, yes, and cheaper. But um, the same kind of uh, engineering and work goes into these things now as, as happened in, in the 80s and 70s. And uh, same kind of problems, just uh, slightly different technology from year to year. Somebody on your show, someone mentioned that um, in those days we might have worn suits. And you know, I, I need to say that we didn't wear suits in those days. We wore just what we're wearing today. <laughs> I'm sorry to misrepresent you. Let's put the record straight. No suits. Yeah. Unfortunately, I do remember the suits. I had a suit with a vest and a tie and all that in, back in, uh, oh, what was it, uh, 60, 67, 68, 69. And the Beatles ended all that. We let our hair grow out, and we started wearing pink shirts. Uh, check in, Betty, to this question of, of the relevance of this book today. I, I think it goes to uh, some of what Chuck was saying earlier about the importance of, co of corporate culture, of team culture, and, the, uh, and creativity. Uh, and I think that's uh, another way of saying what Carl just said, which is the platform we're working on is, is different, but the creative process is still the same. And uh, we're a very uh, creative team and a very uh, uh, well, uh, a, a team, a very diverse team that really functioned well together. So I think anyone that's looking at trying to pull a team together is, uh, could get a lot of lessons from the book. And Chuck? Uh, well, I just agree. Um, I think, you know, one thing is that it, the cycle continues and the engineers like to do that. So we're, once we're done, it's like, oh, I got to do another one. Got to do something different, and it's gonna it's gonna be something different because your whole industry is gonna change. That's something I didn't know at that age. Uh, we have one final question that's come in, which is to Carl. Uh, what is that motherboard behind you? Oh, oh yes, uh, a couple boards. They're they're uh, they're really uh, patch panels that I use to debug um, circuit boards for our for our control system. These are test boards, and uh, they allow us to, to um, bring up the logic in our in our actual products. So this is this is our computer, our little uh, computer lab here, and there's I don't know, twelve computers in here, and it gets warm with the door shut, and uh, I spend some time in here, a fair amount of time in here, debugging my software and bringing up systems. The debugging continues. Are you oh yes, later? all the same. <laughs> All right, well, that's about all the time we have. Um, and I want to thank so much uh, all of our panelists for taking the time out to chat with us. Uh, they are Carl Alsing, Chuck Holland, Betty Shanahan. Thank you guys so much. Oh, uh, thanks for having us. This was fun. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. And I'll put in one final plug for anyone watching who uh, lives in the New York area. If you're a New Yorker, you want to meet other Soul of a New Machine fans, uh, we are hosting a meetup at Google headquarters here in Manhattan uh, on Monday. Uh, and Tracy Kidder will actually be joining us in person for that. So if you have a question for him, you can ask it to the man himself. Uh, and you can find out more about that and reserve your spot at sciencefriday.com slash meetup. And thank you all so much. Have a great night. Thank you, Annie. All right. Bye-bye.